You know what question I want to be asked more? If you answered, what tier is this killer, I'm sorry that you were raised to be an absolute sheep. What was the best Dead by Daylight chapter? What added the most substantial thing to the game? The time I felt the team at BHVR was on their best behavior. Well, I won't bury the lead. That chapter was Demise of the Faithful. You might think it's upsetting that they've never topped this in almost four years, but I don't find it too sad, honestly. The current fanbase of Dead by Daylight rests on such a precarious perch that anything that changes too much is like threatening WMDs. Though I can't really remember the last time I didn't have any qualms with a chapter. I can now, that's for sure, but Demise of the Faithful was cool. Cool trailer, cool character design, cool power, cool perks. The closest letdown was that 50% of the map was reused assets. But hey, these were the guys that allegedly stole mobile game Bethesda code, so I knew the alleged playing field. It was a character that felt very consistent with its theme, and was truly what DBD needed. And I won't be a fool, I know that I just invited hell on the comments section. A bunch of people ready to tell me that it was actually Stranger Things or Resident Evil. Thankfully, even if you're not a free thinker, you can still toil the algorithm for me. So what is the plague? Outside of that one word YouTube won't let me say for a while. She's a Babylonian killer from 10,000 BC that kept insisting that she didn't have the ick, despite the fact that her very toe fell off. Then everyone just listened to her. Then again, I've listened to worse looking people. She's an interesting killer that relies off a very universal power. By universal, I mean it's a simple power that does a little bit of something to everything in the match. One that affects the environment directly, affects survivors, and allows survivors to affect other survivors. The plague's power allows her to charge up a blast of Malort in her mouth, which she will then fire for the length at which you've held it down for. Once infected, they will slowly grow in infection as they run, interact, or are hit with more of the stream. Once the meter reaches its maximum, survivors will become injured, broken, and start vomiting. Survivors at max infection can also transfer the virus to the things they touch, which will then infect people who try to interact with that object, creating a lovely ecosystem where you have to do pretty much 95% of the work. The kicker is that you need to get their infection to its maximum rate for that effect to take place. Once infected with the basic infection, survivors cough and emanate a green cloud, and that's about it. So when you chase someone, it's up to you as to how you deal with them. You could, in infect them, then attack normally, or you can continue vomiting until they have max infection. The reason you might want to infect them all the way while they're in a chase, outside of the obvious three reasons, is that any survivor that rescues them from a hook will become infected with the virus. See, generators and totems might help you spread it, but this is guaranteed. You might also be wondering how survivors can deal with the infection. Throughout the trial, there are six pools of devotion. After a brief interaction, survivors can mentos their mouth and remove the virus at the cost of ruining the pool. The attachment to that is that if you drink that god-awful swill, you become supercharged with Malort Black Label. This doesn't infect, but it does damage, and it's very good at dealing it. It's basically a fast-acting whip that survivors just sort of take. You can lose it if you're stunned, but it's a ranged attack. Why the fuck are you standing next to a piece of wood? But if you do lose it, you just lost a major resource. As that cycle we just talked about leads into a management system, when you start a plague match, two paths emerge from the woods. On the first path, all of the survivors refuse to cleanse, weakening themselves in the long term and giving the killer authority over the match, choosing to believe in a few psychotic redditors that told them it was safer than using the very easy and available solutions all over the place. Undertones aside, if this is what you choose to do as a survivor, you better be rushing the objectives like nothing else. The second route is that the survivors always use the fountains, remaining at full health but giving you access to your corrupt blast. As scary as the Black Malort is, in my experience, I tend to go down the second path way more than the first. Hence why I try to actually deal a bit of non-infective damage to survivors from time to time, to get some natural slowdown there. The biggest downside to the Plague's power is that the pools of devotion fully heal the survivors that use them. So one of the best methods of slowing the game down, healing, is almost non-existent to her. This doesn't matter with the Corrupt Purge, as this does damage without infecting, Though it's not clear why it doesn't infect you, or what she's puking at you. If it's acidic, if it's, I don't know, heavy. There's this one quote from an ancient DBD Reddit AMA that I have never forgotten, and I want to preserve it here. Someone asks, what does it feel like to get hit by the Plegu's corrupt purge? It stings. Also, it's strangely hot and cold at the same time. But the smell is what hits you like a ton of bricks. This is just my perception. Some people like it. Matthew Cote. Dead by Daylight game director. There's a tactical timing to getting the Corrupt Purge. 
Obviously, you don't want to walk a pilgrimage away from all the objectives to get it. Just like Little Caesars, you want it when it's hot and ready. If a survivor is looping nearby, take it. Don't get super economical if survivors are cleansing frequently. Take it often and don't be scared, it doesn't bite, just stings. Because if you don't, when survivors cleanse from every pool on the map, it causes a little overload effect, where you're forced to get the purge at the cost of every fountain turning pure again. You just lost access to five corrupt purges, and the racist mods show up reopening access to every pool once more. Though it can be a good thing in certain situations. Getting the purge without having to get on your knees is a plus. It can come in handy when you're chasing an annoying survivor, or better yet, when you're attending to someone on hook. The corrupt purge lasts a good long while, and the fire rate is fast enough to down a survivor before they can get off a rescue. Of course, one reassurance and it's all over, but listen, that Rebecca has been wasting that perk slot for at least five games now. To circle things back around, we need to talk about how her plague lets you monitor objectives. The plague can infect generators, which cause survivors who interact with it to get sick. And you can infect more than just one generator at once, or hell, thing at once. You can infect totems, dropped pallets, exit gates, and subway turnstiles. You can't tell where someone got infected, but you can tell when they got infected. You'll see their player icon turn green. So if you've got good memory or just check over your fucking shoulder, you'll know what objective they were tinkering with. It also means that if a survivor isn't infected during the endgame 1v1 collapse, you basically know when they're on a door. That way, when you mori them in Latin, you can say, look for the fucking hat next time. Plague released with three perks, that's slap. There's no joke in that. I'm not even gonna mispronounce their name. You don't get to work up to being the best chapter without giving cool perks. Corrupt Intervention activates at the start of the trial, picking the three farthest generators from you and blocking them for two minutes. This is a good hint on where to find survivors as they tend to spawn over there. This tends to give you an opportunity to get the ball rolling before dead hard off the record decisive strike. You might still find that someone gets on a fresh generator, cooking up a nice meal while you're chasing everyone else. And the solution to that is to learn to take some fucking responsibility for once. I find this works best with trap setting killers like Trapper, Hag, and Sword of the Demogorgon. Doesn't work on Freddy, but neither does behavior anymore. They don't make a lot of trap killers, on account of the fact that each one of these killers is on very polarizing ends of the power scale. Trapper especially can't do a dang thing without spending a good few minutes setting up his traps, and even more doubling back to fix them like a neighbor going to give those kids a piece of his mind. The second perk is Infectious Fright. This perk triggers when you down a survivor, causing everyone in your terror radius to scream and reveal their location, which can net you easy pressure or warn you of a little scamper nearby. There are certain killers it works better with, as they can use this information a bit more readily than their counterparts. The nurse can blink and get a fast hit, the doctor can use his static blast to inflict madness, and Nemesis's zombies are attracted to the screams because they're not that stupid. Even the plague can use it, as she can go on someone fast without committing to a chase. Just don't get lost in the sauce if you're not confident in your slug. The last thing you want to do is leave the sleepy Dwight there to get picked up while you chase the Nia that just downed an Adderall. Dark Devotion is the last perk, or DD for short. Dark Devotion activates when the obsession is injured. When this happens, they will gain a terror radius of 32 meters, while you lose yours, effectively turning them into a decoy. Dark Devotion is unironically one of my favorite perks in Dead by Daylight. It's fun, wacky, and can have so many little synergies. The obvious effect is that you can make survivors flee the obsession as they believe it's you. Then you can sneak up on them, which is kind of why it sucks, just like an actual DD. It never does its job without getting a little messy. Usually any survived with friends will smile to themselves and joke about how your perk means nothing to them. You'll hit someone and the opposition will clock their brains into I spy with my little eye and annoying Nia that will never fucking die. That said, people are fallible. They'll make a mistake, and if they keep making it, they'll learn to overcome it, and yet they spend that unequaled gift on Dead by Daylight. Once you roll your DD down a hill and kick him in the ribs a few times, you can make it so that your victims heal slower with Calrophobia, or just put a ton of little terror radius debuffs on them and watch them bang their head into the walls and ruin everyone's life like a toddler who just discovered Adderall. And I really do want to stress, for most people the perk will work as it is. Don't always assume the world's out to get you. It's only that Nia, really. This is what makes Demise of the Faithful my favorite chapter. Even the survivor counterpart had satisfying perks, like the one that makes you harder to spot after a generator is finished, and I've never seen it in my fucking life. Or the one that lets you burst out of a locker and smack the killer with the door. For Plague's add-ons, you actually have some pretty good ones. My personal favorites are the ones that make the infection linger on objects for longer. Using both will make your infection linger for a whole minute and a half. Even though they don't actually say what the infection is. It could be the bubonic plague or chickenpox. Guess they don't have vaccines in the realm. Wait, 
No, they do. Some of the more popular ones start with some of the pools of devotion already sickened. If they take the road most traveled, you might find yourself without any corrupt charges. There's also this weird green one that lets you charge up your bomb ten times faster, but the real crowning jewel are the emetics which make your Malort even nastier, increasing how fast survivors gain infection. With these tied together, you can get a survivor to max infection with one fully charged blast. Plague's iridescent oxen plow makes survivors scream upon reaching max infection, and makes them oblivious for 30 seconds. Just kidding, I just wanted to make sure you were listening. The Plague has two eerie add-ons, and they're, for all intents and purposes, pretty damn cool, even when I'm lying about them. The black incense reveals the auras of survivors when they vomit. Vomiting only occurs at max infection and seems to happen more when a survivor is running, which gives you chase and map knowledge. The iridescent seal activates when a generator is finished, instantly giving you the corrupt purge, but for less than you would otherwise. Basically, instead of taking one of two roads in a wood, you just burn the forest down. Maybe outsource the effort to some migrants you're underpaying. It does bring some push to chases that you're losing, some guys looping you too long, a gen pops and you can instantly down him. I like both of these because they feel a bit special. The incense provides game-changing knowledge, but the seal is just a slap in the enemy's face. A lot of the red add-ons as of late are too concerned with being fair, even though this game will never be fair. There are so many moving parts and no one actually knows how you're meant to play the damn thing. If you introduce stability to this weird thing, all you do is childproof our toys. Red add-ons are rare and don't pop up every game. They're gonna be unfair anyway. That is my unofficial answer to that dog shit Mori system they were testing out by the way. Anyway, did I tell you the reason I was actually here? Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? I made this video with the pure intention of talking about these perks on her because I think I found something really unique and special, like I always do, to the indifference of the player base. But no 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 please, this time it's gonna be different. These perks are specifically ones that synergize with the plague's power. You you could run all of these or one of them and you'd still get there. Well, probably none because Dead by Daylight is such a massive grind that the few people who are still pouring points into her are the ones with every kind of STD. The first one I want to mention is likely the best. It's a dredge perk called Dissolution. Dissolution triggers when any survivor becomes injured. If a survivor fast vaults a pallet during its duration, the pallet is instantly broken and the perk deactivates. The problem with this perk is that normally survivors become injured and receive a speed boost which they will use to fly away from used pallets and render dissolution useless. But not the plague, as max infection doesn't give that speed boost. It's also any survivor getting injured by any means. So if someone on the other side of the map hits max infection, you now have this bonus against a totally unrelated person. It's worth mentioning that anyone who vaults a pallet while this perk is up is effectively dead. In keeping with the theme of injuring a survivor by any means, Hysteria works well too. Hysteria inflicts obliviousness on all injured survivors once someone goes from healthy to injured. The problem with this perk has been the one that every oblivious chase perk suffers. Why would you want to hide your terror radius from the person you've just smacked with a giant air freshener? Now that some people might hit max infection at a distance, you're now given a golden window to sneak up on them. Just remember that dissolution only triggers if the survivor hears your heartbeat. So don't run hysteria and dissolution together. That's a formal warning. Don't come crying to my free thinking comment section otherwise. If you want to hide your heartbeat in tandem with dissolution, I recommend Trails of Torment. This perk activates when you break a generator, highlighting it in yellow for survivors. As long as that generator is regressing, you're considered undetectable. It will also stop when a survivor gets injured. The idea here is that you kick a generator, then vomit on it, creating a sort of trade-off. Survivors will know you're out there lurking on their friends, but is that worth becoming sick? This could also be stifled by someone reaching max infection, cancelling the effect. If that happens, I think you've made bigger enemies than Nia, and a guide like this can't help you. With killers like this that can go a good long while without using their primary attack, I tend to recommend Coup de Gras. This perk is given a token every single time a generator is completed. The next time you lunge, the distance is increased by 80%. It's a perk survivors don't tend to expect. They do a little math to tell how long they can run before dropping the pallet, and Coup de Gras just sort of turbocharges you and throws them off their game. They'll think you're playing Freddy, Wesker, or just subtle cheating. Franklin's demise causes survivors to drop their items when hit with a basic attack. If a survivor is fully infected when they drop the item, that item will also be infected, and it would be quite funny to see them cleanse then get sick all over again. Does it happen a lot? No. Should you try anyway? Yeah. This is why I like this killer so much. There are so many wild ways her power can turn out. She's a Swiss army knife if all of the things inside it were for fixing disco balls. Not everyone wants to fix a disco ball, but shit, have you ever gotten your groove on? Live a little.
I also can't forget Blood Echo. This perk activates when a survivor is hooked, inflicting hemorrhage and exhaustion on them for 45 seconds. This adds another big penalty to staying sick and can even force some survivors to cleanse when they might not otherwise. Honestly, Blood Echo has made such a small splash on every other killer that I almost forgot to add it here, but I, ju I just knew that it would keep me up at night if I didn't. Like forgetting Zan Shan tactics on the artist. I would lose my mind if I forgot. Maybe that's the punishment I get for choosing to stick around a game I should have outgrown two years ago. That's my answer. That's why this is my favorite DVD chapter. Demise of the Faithful doesn't give a damn what you think of it, and neither do I. Video's over. The runner-up was likely the Silent Hill chapter. Not just because it was absolutely nuts for happening, but because I think every perk and character in that chapter still had some life in it. Yet I really don't think this is a quantitative thing, something you can analyze with a microscope. Especially considering that your lab was blown up with a WMD. Like imagine if they added this killer today, one where the entire focus wasn't appeasing the random whims of a community that wants that killer, the one that is super strong but doesn't rely on camping, has perks that fixes the gen speed but aren't annoying, has high presence over loops though isn't oppressive. Instead of being a solution to the DBD enigma, it was just a creative little thing whose sole purpose was to add cool ideas. Well how would you fix DBD, hmm? How would you suggest they fix it? That's the worst question. Don't ask me that you fucking weirdo. <laughs> Begun.